Hi, and welcome to Codex. Our speaker today is Ursula Molter, who is a professor at the University of Buenos Aires and director of the Instituto de Investigaciones Matemáticas. <laughs> Dr. Molter is an expert in geometric and harmonic analysis. Today, she will tell us about subspace data fitting. Take it away, Ursula. Okay, um, thank you for the invitation. And I ap apologize from the beginning that there will be some overlap with my talk that I gave at the Fields Institute. I, we have some progress, but there are some things which have an overlap. And I'm very happy that John Benedetto got a, his schedule adjusted because this is actually like a continuation of a talk I gave for his 80th birthday. So uh, first I make the formal acknowledgements that I received support from the European Union through a European grant, which is why I'm now in Spain and you see everything <laughs> dark around. Well, you don't see because I'm inside. And I also got some support from the Argentinian government, which uh, may be a lot, but for European, US, or Asian standards is very little. So uh, this work I'm talking about, OK. Sorry. It didn't work. The, the, this work uh, I'm going to talk to about today is a joint work with which we are doing with Davide Barbieri, Carlos Cabrelli, also from Buenos Aires, and Eugenio Hernandez. These two are at the Universe, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid in Spain. And uh, but it is based on earlier work I have done. Uh, First, the original work was with Akram, Doug Harding, and Carlos at, while we were visiting Vanderbilt. And part of this work overlaps with a thesis of a student of mine, which I co-supervised with Maria del Carmen Moure, who worked on crystal groups. So these are this work took advantage of all the previous work to get our new results. So the problem we have is very easy to describe for people in this audience, probably very familiar. You consider a big data set F, which has uh, lots and lots of vectors in a Hilbert space. And we want to find some small subspace inside the Hilbert space that is close to my data set. In which sense is it close? Well, that we could change, but we are considering that uh, the mistake that we produce when we take the distance from each of the data sets to its projections on the subspace is the smallest possible smallest among all the pos above all the subspaces which have a certain property first question that arises is it always to find such a smallest one how can we define which properties we want and this is what this talk is about i will be very brief on the earlier work but in order to so that it is understandable i have to give the necessary definitions so the easy way is for everybody in RN, uh, we want to find the best L-dimensional subspace that approximates our given data. And uh, this can be done if our data is in R capital N, which is huge. Using the theorem of Eckhart Young, actually it's a theorem of Schmidt, but I guess since John is here, I should mention that also Cauchy already talked about this. So there is a theorem called Eckhart Young theorem, which tells us the following. If we take the singular value decomposition of uh, F, 
using the gram mat matrix, which is F star F, we take all the inner products. Then I know that the gram mat matrix is diag diagonalizable. And I order the eigenvalues of the, this matrix in decreasing order, talking from highest to lowest. U is my unitary matrix Rm in Rm times M. Remember, we had M data, so the Gramian is an M by M matrix. And this, uh, uni this U is unitary, meaning that the norm of the vectors is one and they are ortho ortho orthogonal. And then I take uh, the vectors phi sub j equal to sigma j. Let me say what I'm doing. I take a linear combination of my data using as coefficients the elements of the ith row of my u matrix, the ith column, I'm sorry. And I multiply it by the singular value sigma j, which is minus one half, is the square root, one over the square root of the eigenvalues of the matrix lambda. And they are zero if they are not, if lam, lambda has zero eigenvalues. So this theorem is the theorem of Eckhart Young. The vectors P1, Pl that I define this way, taking the L largest eigenvalues, these vectors are span the best subspace of dimension L. Well, that best approximates my data F. And as you see, the span of these vectors is included in the span of my vectors f. Okay, so I have L vectors which span an L-dimensional subspace. I have M data and the vectors phi1, phi L are linear combinations of the data. This is, I just say it because it will be important later. The problem comes when we want to go into infinite dimensional space, like we take H L2 of our R N, and then I want to find the best shift invariant space of length L that fits the data. Why I do want a shift invariant space? Because in applications, it is, you, it is very often a good model to model certain types of data. So that's why I will use shift invariant spaces. So far, I don't put any other restriction on the spaces which I want to approximate with. And well, just for those who don't re recall, a shift invariant space in L2 of Rn or Rd is a closed subspace such that if F is in V, that all the translates by integers are in V, where I use the notation F of X minus K for the translates. And we say that a set of generators of a subspace V is if I can see V as the span of all the translates of a certain subset of my vectors and the length of this shift invariant space is defined as the minimum L such that P1, P L are generators for V. And obviously uh, the length of the space could be infinite if we need infinite vectors, but if the vectors are, if I can find a, a set of finite dimension, then the length will be the smallest length among all the possible lengths that I have. 
So what are we looking at here? I have an infinite dimensional space, L2 of Rd. I have a finite number of data, F1, Fm. They are in the Hilbert space. And I want to approximate them with a infinite dimensional space, right? Because all the translates of a finite number of vectors are, is an infinite dimensional space. So I am trying to approximate with an infinite dimensional space. So it doesn't have any sense to use Eckhart Young or something equivalent. But there is a key lemma which says the following. If I have any Hilbert space, infinite or finite dimensional, and I have M data, like I was have from the beginning, if I call capital X the span of my data, which obviously is finite dimensional because I'm talking about finite data and assume that I can find a set M with some dimension that minimizes the projection of my finite data into onto the set F. Then I can find a sub a space W, a subspace of my data, which also have dimension less or equal than N, such that the projection of my data onto this subset of the span is equal to the original um, project di distance. Well, since I claim that I always want to make one proof, I will do this because this is easy. So let W be the projection onto the span of my space M. Then the dimension obviously of W is less or equal than M, then N, and W is inside the span of F1, Fm. So what do I do? The norm of the distance of F minus the projection onto W of F squared is, by definition, the infimum of all the distances between F minus G, where G is in W. Well, and is less or equal than take only those data which are in uh, which are the projection of my data onto the space w so here i take the smallest g and here i take the projections of all the f's and then uh, since f is already in its span i can take can say F is equal to its projection, and this is less or equal than the norm of F minus its projection onto M. And since M was the best one, the other inequality is trivial. So using this lemma, we could prove the following theorem that if we have a set of functions, then we can prove that there exists a finitely generated shift invariant space V such that the projection of my data onto, the onto V is the distance between my data and its projection is less or equal than the distance of my data to any other shift invariant space of length L or smaller. And by this lemma, we say that the pre previous lemma, lemma, we can say the optimal shift invariant space can be chosen such that V is inside the span of F and its translations. 
So uh, the ingredient of this proof relies on the theory of the um, range function, which I use as a title for this transformation. How do I redefine the range function? First, we take an isometry from uh, any shift invariant space V to this L space L2 of omega, L little L2 of ZD, where omega is RD quotient ZD, ZD because here you could write ZD star, but it's, in this case, it's the same. And here I forgot the D, I see. So the tau of F and at an omega is just the trans Fourier transform of F at omega plus K. And you can, uh, since you know that V is the span, uh, sorry, V is the span of the translates of P sub I, tau of the space V is the span of the exponential trans, uh, multiplications of the tau of the generators of the shift invariant space. And you can prove that F is in V if it only, only F tau of F of omega is in the span of tau of phi, phi I of little omega for all omega, little omega. So what did we do? We took an infinite dimensional space, V, and transformed it into infinitely many finite dimensional spaces, subspaces of little l2 of zd. So I am now in a finite dimensional setting and I define what is called the range function. The range function is the span of the images of tau of phi sub i at omega and the map from omega to j of omega is called the range function. This is uh, uh, the fundamental work of Helson of 1962 and beautifully this are uh, this are, um, uh, treated by Bonick et al. in a beautiful paper in 2000, where they extended to groups and not just, they extended the work of Helson. And so we do our, make our setting like before, we take the, uh, uh, our uh, function tau, by defining all the tau's of my f, my f's are the data. So I take this span of the f1's up to fm, and I define exactly as before the phi hat j as the sum of the tau's of my fi multiplied by the coordinates of the i column vector of the matrix u which diagonalizes the gram matrix of f and here so i have one for each omega i do this and i claim that i get a measurable function and this obviously you need to prove, uh, but you can show that you get a redefining redef each phi sub j hat s at each omega. In this way, I obtain a function phi, which generates a shift invariant space. I don't know what, 
uh, such that the span of these fees is a minimizer of all the shift invariant spaces of length L. And in fact, it turns out to be a Parseval frame generator because we have uh, infinite elements, right? So the mistake you produce is as before, the sum of the last eigen uh, values of the diagonal gram matrix to the, I think I forgot here the um, minus one half. So you take the last uh, singular values and this is the mistake. Well, the, where our work with David and Eugenio starts, we wanted to approximate other groups of images than those that are shift invariant because this shift invariant spaces are good models for these kinds of images. But as soon as I rotate the images, they are not anymore um, shift invariant. And so we wanted to introduce groups that are not necessarily groups of isometries that are not necessarily only shifts and we tried to use crystal groups this was because i was working on crystal wavelets but here we have an expert which knows much more of crystal wavelets than i but so this is why we came up with the crystal groups because these are groups of isometry which also have like the translation a uh, fundamental domain, which means that the, you can tile RD with the, uh, under the action of this group and the, it's the tiling so that only the boundaries overlap. And in particular, the, work, the groups that we considered are those that are called splitting. If they are a semi-direct group of a subgroup, of a finite subgroup G and the lattice lambda. So now the lambda is a lattice, not anymore the, uh, the diagonal of the gram matrix, but in any case. So we consider a generalization of the shift invariant spaces, which we call gamma invariant spaces. And we say that a subspace S is gamma invariant if S is, clo if S is closed and translation compo composed with T cut with RG of F is in S whenever F is in S and K comma G in gamma, where gamma is the semi-direct proof of lambda half cross or whatever G. And I use this order because this was the order we chose at the beginning. You could choose another one, but then you have to always be consistent because we all in this community know that translations and rotations don't commute. But you can consider the shift invariant, the gamma invariant spaces the other way around and defining this operation the other way around. And Again, as in the shift invariant space, this is just a generalization. We can find uh, the gamma invariant spaces, which are the span of the rotations and the length of the shift invariant, the gamma invariant space will be the num minimum number of generators. Let me just check in the chat because you're fine. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know if the, the questions were for me or only for the general. So, sorry. So now we look at all the uh, gamma invariant spaces that have a length of length L or less. And we ask ourselves if we can find 
the best gamma invariant spaces that approximate our data. And in fact, we could prove that there exists such a space. And again, the generators will be finite linear combinations of the data. So we improved in one sense on our original uh, paper and obtained that result. But we would like to think of the question if it is possible to improve the choice of our either shift invariant or gamma invariant space. Um, obviously, you will lose a little bit of approximation, but I mean, you have a bigger mistake by approximate, but maybe for applications, you get smooth functions or well localized functions, or maybe you can find in the Schwartz class, I don't know, but we can want to try something better. So we started to try to find a, some a approximation with some additional properties. Okay, and so we got the following theorem, which is, I will read it very slowly. I put everything on the screen and instead of going line by line, because I think you want everybody reads it in its own uh, time. So we take as before M data in a Hilbert space, and we take S as closed subspace inside H, and we call E, F, and S. So like you look in the lower rows, I changed the notation from the first and the rest. The mistake, we call the, the error you produce by approximating the data F with S, you calculate it as the sum of the mistakes that you make when you project your data Fi onto the subspace S, and I'm using orthogonal projection. So PS is orthogonal projection. So now assume that you want something as, for example, the Paley Wiener space. You want uh, the best approximation inside the Paley Wiener space. So you take some closed subspace of your choice inside the Hilbert space. And then you want to take the best subspace inside this class, right? We, because we want, for example, that they are in the Paley Wiener space. This is what I. Uh, we'll use as an example. We can prove that the mistake you make when you take the data f and you look at a subspace of v is the same as the mistake you make when you take the projections of your data onto v with the same subspace S, plus the mistake you do when you project your data F onto V. Obviously, when you project your data onto V, there will be an error, unless your data is already in V. So this means that your data already were, were in a, let's say, Paley Wiener space. But usually your data will be something which is not in the desirable space. So what does this mean? that if I get the smallest subspace inside V that approximates my data F in the sense that the mistake is smaller than any other subspace inside V, this is equivalent of finding the best subspace for the projected data. So I, what do I have to do? Well, here uh, I skip this. 
So what I, do I have to do if I want to find the best approximation in my paley Wiener space V of omega? Well, I take my data f and I take my gamma or shift as before and I know that the minimum uh, shift invariant space inside my paley Wiener space V omega will be the best shift invariant space that approximates my projected data. And this I know how to do. Because before, if I had my data F, I knew how to find the best F, the best L-dimensional space. And so by the previous theorem, I can reduce the, pro the problem of finding the best subspace, for example, in a V of omega, by looking at the projected data and finding the best approximation space in there. So if we want smooth Cs, we need to project our data onto V sub omega. Well, now the question is, which omega are we going to choose? Well, and here I come into some a little bit more technical things. Uh, what I do is I take, I imagine my data, since I'm looking for it, this for applications, from the beginning, I suppose my data are in some huge square. So I, in, I am inside a huge d-dimensional cube. And I take my data and define the function phi from um, the, this huge space where my data lives into the reals, which is the sum of the functions at C, the Fourier transfer of my data, I'm sorry, the norm of the Fourier function of my data at C and the sum over all the my M's. So I have this, this function C, if the bigger the, oh, so then I call, let me finish. Then I call omega of T, those C in RD, such that phi of C is bigger than some threshold T. What does this mean? Well, I will only consider those places where my Fourier transform is, let's say, bigger than 100. For to say something, T is a number. But now I want to condition the size of my set omega, so I take M a positive number m, and I take m star, the measure of the set, which is the smallest t, such that the measure of omega of t is less than m. So this, everybody has to write it down by himself. If I didn't make a mistake in the slide, this is the correct M star. But then with this choice of M star, the idea is that I take the, a set omega, which is the largest such that the, uh, the size of its is M and the omega, the size of the sets is less than M and that the sets is where the, C's, the phi, the sum of these Fourier transforms are 
bigger than M, right? Bigger than M is, this is the a choice of the M. And I can prove that if I take any omega such that the, the size of this omega M is M star, where remember M star is the size of this set omega, which is, I had a hard time explaining in words what it is. And um, from all these sets, I take that one, which has size M star and is in between omega is smaller than the supremum of those of the, where the measure is bigger than M. So for this, I have that the maximum of the integrals of this function C, which is where my function is bigger than E. So I'm looking at where is my function bigger than M star is exactly the set omega M. And so with these notations, the minimum of the compact sets E, which the measure is M star of the sum of the norm of half a hat I of one minus the characteristic function of E is equal to the norm of my, of F I hat times one minus the characteristic function of omega M. And so this should be the best omega. And this is how I choose it. And so here I made just a uh, picture because, well, we know I can choose omega M compact. And so this will be a fundamental domain for my lattice. And then the question that can arise is whether you, it is better, better to take this omega or to take this omega with smaller pieces. Now we have four these pieces here, and this is now a, like a four, for to cover my whole basis. We have my whole set omega. I need to have four translations, but in fact. We can find examples which show that taking this one, the smaller one, or taking the bigger one is in one case better and the other one worse. So the good thing is to find the omega and then you pick the lattice that you want. This is not, it's not making any difference to take a different, for the same omega, changing the lattice if you don't change the number of generators you allow. It's pretty easy to see that if you take four generators in this case, instead of one in the other, you will have a smaller error because you are allowed to take into account different features of my function. But it's not gonna to change if you um, allow the same number of functions. And so, I think this is what I wanted to say, but before you leave, I will show the examples, which maybe some of you already saw. This is without choosing any good omega. This is just the approximation error of the original picture by the crystal group with four rotations. So I take rotation by P o, pi over, over two, pi, three pi over two, and no rotation. This is the easiest crystal group in the plane. And here I take 
I should have memorized. Seven generators, 14 generators, and 20 generators. I don't know why he didn't go to 21. And I say that these images are only work of Davide. I'm just putting them here. He is the one who implemented them. So, um, uh, but I, sh I think it's pretty apparent that these images are very good representations. And I give you some more examples. And here you see almost perfect reconstruction here. The percent is the, I, I think it's the take between the original and the result. So here you have uh, an, an image with, with many straight lines. Here you have an image with where many rounded things. So he picked images that were very different. And here you have everything mixed. And I think this is it. Yes, <laughs> this one I didn't want to show. So now I go back. So here is how we can calculate the error, but well. And now thank you for your attention. I think I'm a little bit early, but I didn't want to bother you with the proof of the theorem. <laughs> so I had calculated it with the proof, but being the time of the day it is here, I thought you were also tired, but for you it's very early in the day. So probably you could have stand it. <laughs> All right, let's thank our speaker by smashing that reaction button, which is now animated in the new versions of Zoom.